Make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. So Steve, let's talk about the A-10. Let's How do. did you get posted to the A-10? Uh, well, it was one of those things that the, uh, the Air Force uh, uh, changes every now and then just to keep us on our toes <laughs> and uh, one of the things that they started doing in uh, in the uh, mid to late 70s was they they started to replace uh, the old war horse the F4 uh, with uh, airplanes that were a bit more specialized the F15 was an air to air bird and uh, somebody in the bowels of the Pentagon uh, decided to figured out that uh, uh, an airplane that was geared to uh, air to ground, geared to close air support might be useful in the future. And they started working on uh, what was to become the A-10. Well, at the time, uh, 1978 or so, I was at uh, RAF Bentwaters here in the UK, uh, down near Ipswich. Uh, I, was, uh, I was an instructor pilot and a, a weapons officer in, uh, uh, in the Phantom. And uh, it came to pass that the Air Force decided to phase out the Phantom at Bentwaters and replace it with the Warthog. And that's, uh, that's how uh, I got into it. I had to be talked into it. Uh, narcissistic tendencies of the uh, fighter pilot being what they are. Um, Never. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't want to climb out of the meanest, most aggressive looking airplane I'd ever seen in my life to uh, something that was butt ugly, let's face it. <laughs> and uh, we had no Google at the time, we had no internet. It, uh, you, you, we really didn't know much about the A-10 over here in Europe. We'd never seen one, never been close to one. But we did know it was ugly. And uh, it was something that, uh, something that in my tiny mind uh, was, a, was a detriment. Uh, that changed rather abruptly and uh, for the better, but that's, uh, that's the way I looked at it. So when the transition came, uh, I, I finally got talked into signing up and uh, I went back to the States, checked out in the A-10 and we brought the squadron back to Bentwaters from, uh, from davis uh in Arizona where the A-10 training took place. Obviously your thoughts there, but did every Phantom pilot feel that same way about the A-10 or going on to I'm it? not sure about everyone, but a lot of us did, <laughs> I, I think. Uh, again, you know, we're a, we're a funny breed. We, uh, we, 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 unfortunately, we worry about how we look. We worry about the airplane we're in. Is it shiny? Is it pointy-nosed? Or does it have straight wings and big motors on the back? And, you know, so uh, I, I would suspect a lot of them initially felt that way. But uh, I think almost all of us were seduced. Yeah. So for people who don't know much about the A-10, which is probably not many, but uh, can you tell the role of the aircraft? Well, it's very simple. Uh, the role of the airplane is uh, close air support. A close air support, support of the troops on the ground. We never had an airplane that was designed to do that uh, in, in, in the modern era. And uh, the, uh, the nature of conflict being what it, what it was, uh, it, it, it would seem to be the proper thing to do because we were going to be facing situations uh, where the troops were going to need support and a fast moving airplane that burns lots of fuel and can't stay on site for a long time uh, is, is not the answer. Mm -hmm. So uh, they came up with the A-10, uh, they came up with uh, a concept that uh, uh, would would help us in what was the threat at the time, and that was Soviet armor. And the idea was, uh, if you can build a gun that'll work against Soviet armor and put it in an airplane that'll provide close air support, you got a winning combination. And they did. And you'll be able to tell me if this is true or not. Apparently the Air Force didn't really care for the Air 10, or they still don't. Um, yeah, that's funny, isn't it? The Air Force has been trying to get rid of the A-10 for many years. And I don't know, again, whether it's a, 
whether it's an aesthetic sort of thing, uh, you know, uh, guys, <laughs> guys up at uh, guys up at headquarters level, I, whether they just like airplanes that are fast and have pointy noses and 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 look shiny and sleek, uh, but. Uh, I don't think many of them can deny that the A-10 did what no other airplane could do in terms of supporting the troops, in terms of uh, uh, the, the Gulf War, those kind of things. Uh, there wasn't another airplane that could, uh, could do those things, and, uh, and there won't be for a long time. Fortunately, uh, cooler heads have prevailed, and the a 10s still going to be around for quite some time. I read just recently they're going to get rid of 42 of them uh, in the very near future. Wow. It's still going to leave some. The Air National Guard and the Reserves have, uh, have lots of A-10s. The airplane's still going to be around as it should be mm -hmm. because uh, we're going to find ourselves in, in conflicts of that type again and nobody else can do the job. Exactly, yeah. So let's talk about your ground training and how was it different from the F-4? There was only one seat. <laughs> exactly. So and uh, <laughs> interesting because uh, none of us who transitioned into the A-10, and I, I suppose most pilots, none of us had ever climbed into an airplane first time without uh, somebody there, guardian angel, to keep you out of trouble. Okay. There were two two-seaters built, I think. They were test beds for night operations and that kind of thing. Never used for training. But when you climbed into the A-10 for the first time, it was just you. And that was, a, that was a, an interesting feeling. As it turned out, it was a, a no-brainer because the airplane's very, very simple to, to operate. It's very simple to take off and land and drive and all the rest of it. The tough part is uh, learning to do the mission. Exactly, yeah. Let's talk about your first flight in the A-10. What was that like? Uh, it was different from any first flight I've ever had in an airplane before because there was only one seat. And uh, in essence, uh, they, used to, they used to tell lots of jokes about the A-10. There were many of them. One of them was, uh, you don't need an instructor. He'll just run along on the side with a microphone plugged in. <laughs> well, that wasn't exactly how it worked. But uh, for, the, for the first time ever, I climbed into an airplane from a first trip with no guardian angel in the back seat or on the side. Uh, it turned out to be not a big problem. It's a very simple airplane in terms of, uh, of basic operations. But there was a little bit of butterflies uh, on that first trip. Uh, once we got over that, uh, the, uh, the seduction began and we, uh, we began to realize just uh, what, a, what a great airplane it was going to be. The performance, the, the turn rate, the, uh, uh, the, the fact that it was very, very stable and uh, you could have lots of time out to do your job. Mm -hmm. So being a single seat, was there a simulator at that time? <clears throat> um, no, thankfully. Uh, there wasn't, uh, that I can recall. No, I don't, I, I think there probably is now, but I don't remember ever, ever being a simulator in the A-10. We didn't do that much in the way of instruments, and uh, that's what the F-4 simulator did for us. Uh, but uh, I, uh, I'm racking my brain. No, I don't, I don't remember there ever being a simulator. So how fast did you adjust to be a single seat pilot? Um, it's not difficult to adjust. I mean, you're, you, you, you try to think that way all the time. When you're in a, when you're in a two seater and you got a back seater, uh, you, you operate as a team, but you are always thinking, uh, I'm the guy that's in charge here and I have to make the decisions and I have to do this and that and the other. It, uh, the only difference is uh, you didn't have anybody to ask in the A-10. <laughs> so you didn't miss like chatting to your back seat there? <laughs> no, 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 no. So let's talk about some of the flying training you'll be conducting at this time. The, uh, the training we got in the A-10 uh, was just a basic, very quick training program out at uh, uh, Davis Monthan in Tucson, Arizona. And the idea was it was a program called Ready Thunder. And the program was designed to take a whole squadron of us, out of the F-4 primarily, whole squadron of us, upgrade us into the A-10, teach us the basic tactics and the basic weaponry and that kind of thing, get us up to speed, and then bring us all back to the UK as a squadron, uh, do some in-country training here, and then take uh, what they call a, a, a Stanaval uh, visit, a Stanaval inspection, 
that would certify us as combat ready in a very short period of time. And that's what we did. Uh, the basic training was done out at uh, Davis Monthan. We, uh, we learned how to, how to drop bombs and shoot the gun and all the rest of it. And then we came over to the UK. We learned to fly in the European theater. We worked with the weather as we always had, that kind of thing. We operated in the ranges up around the wash. Um, and we worked, on, uh, we worked on tactics. And then the uh, Stanaval guys came over. I think politically there was no way they were going to fail us, but, uh, but we did very well on it. And they said, uh, all right, uh, 92nd TAC Fighter Squadron, the Skulls, is, uh, is combat ready. Mm -hmm. And there we were. We were ordained. <laughs> ready to go. Yeah. So how did the, the Warthog handle? Oh, like a dream. It's, uh, it's a very, very maneuverable airplane. It's a very, very responsive airplane. Uh, the only thing it doesn't do very well is accelerate. And uh, that's the nature of the beast. It's not meant to go fast. It's meant to, uh, it's meant to stick around for long periods of time, to do the job, to uh, uh, cover the target area and that kind of thing. Uh, if it went a great deal faster, you'd lose some of the ability to, uh, to visualize, you'd lose some of the ability to turn and maneuver in a, a tight area and keep your eyes on a target and that kind of thing. So uh, uh, maneuverability is superb. Uh, visibility is superb. You're, you're sitting right up uh, on, uh, on a seat that's uh, well above the canopy rails. You look down, you've got 360 degrees visibility. It's a great airplane to fly. And did the, in quotes, lack of speed, was that hard to adjust to coming from the Phantom? <laughs> a bit, but, uh, but once you got used to what the nature of the role was, and once you got used to what we were, we were doing, it became apparent that uh, you couldn't do it any other way. Now, I had flown close air support in the Phantom. I had flown air to ground, all that kind of thing. Uh, we weren't very good at it in the Phantom, not because the airplane wasn't very good. The airplane was too fast, and it was difficult to uh, it was difficult to acquire targets on the ground at the speeds we were operating, and it was difficult to, if we missed the target to come back around and reattack with the with the A10. That worked like a charm. It was uh, it was a it was a, a simple thing to do. The airplane was maneuverable enough to do it, and it was slow enough to do it. So Steve, we have to talk about the gun. The what was gun. that like to fire and tell us about that? The gun is, a, is an earth-shaking experience. The gun in the A-10 is, uh, is, is absolutely something to behold. And uh, uh, once upon a time they talked about uh, making the gun and building the aircraft around it. That's not exactly right, although uh, the, the, the specification was for a gun that would, would work against armor. And it had to be a... Uh, a sizable piece of kit. Consequently, they had to make adjustments in the airplane for the uh, the big boy to fit. For example, the nose wheel is offset to the right. It's not in the middle of the airplane. It has to be because the gun goes above it and straight straight on down through the nose. But uh, the gun is uh, 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 the only the only thing better than talking about the gun is shooting it. <laughs> Uh, the, the gun was absolutely superb, and we learned that from the very first time we used it. I have to, uh, I have to give you a little, uh, a little sample or a little comparison here because I flew, I flew the Phantom with the M61 Vulcan, a Gatling gun, very capable gun, and the M61 used one of these, okay? Six barrel Gatling gun, 6,000 rounds a minute, fired lots of bullets this size. Now, the hog. The hog fires 4,200 rounds a minute. That is 70 per second, for those of you who don't do lots of mass. 70 per second of these. Crikey. Now that is a big difference, isn't it? It is a big, <laughs> big difference. And you can tell. Now the gun is, uh, the gun is, it's bolted onto the airplane. You don't have to bore sight it. You don't have to fiddle around with it. It's there. It's highly accurate. Uh, it, uh, it works off a gun cross in the heads-up display. You don't have to adjust it. You may have to adjust a little bit for wind, but it's harmonized at 4,000 feet. Uh, if you're a little outside 4,000 feet, you pick it up just a tad. If you're inside, you might drop it just a little bit, but uh, you don't need to do much of anything. 
when you squeeze that trigger, remember you're getting 70 per second out of the gun. When you squeeze that trigger and you sit there even with a helmet on in an enclosed cockpit and you hear the <laughs> you know something big is happening. And you look 4,000 feet downrange and you see this little clump, big clump of bullets hitting in a very, very small area and you visualize what it might, must be like to be sitting in a tank uh, where those are going off. So the gun in the A-10 uh, is, is and will be legendary. Uh, it, is, uh, it, is, it is the most amazing bit of airborne artillery uh, in the fighter world, I think. Mm -hmm. And can you remember your first time firing that? That must have been an experience. Oh, yes. <laughs> and and that's, exactly, that's exactly what it was. Uh, you roll in, this was of course at a gunnery range, it was, just a, it was just a target out there. You roll in, you put the uh, gun cross on the target, you stabilize, you squeeze the trigger and you don't realize how many rounds you're getting out until you get used to it. I squeezed a little too long. I probably got a couple of hundred rounds out the first time. And again, there's a and then they hit and you look at it and you just say, oh, Jesus. <laughs> because that's the kind of effect it has on, yeah. on you when you fire the gun. I can imagine. So what other weapons could uh, the A-10 carry? All sorts. Uh, hard bombs like, uh, like the F-4 uh, did, 500 pounders, 750 pounders. Uh, the secondary weapon is probably the AGM-65 right. Maverick. And the Maverick is uh, either TV guided or infrared guided. Uh, it's a uh, it's a, a missile, We're on a different oak. and uh, you basically uh, basically lock onto the target with your TV or your infrared, and uh, launch the missile, and uh, it goes there. It's very very accurate. Does a great job. Once again, uh, it's uh, it's good against uh, armor. It'll punch great big holes in a tank, and uh, it's uh, it's it's great. The A-10 also carries all sorts of other stuff. Uh, in recent years, this is another thing we had to talk the Air Force into, they put uh, sidewinders on it for yeah, yeah. self-protection yeah. for air to air. Didn't want to do that, you know. There's some kind of mystique about being in an airplane with a pointy nose, only they can shoot uh, at, other, at other airplanes. But uh, <laughs> interesting fact that I delight in talking about during the Gulf War, which unfortunately I didn't get to take part in. Under the Gulf War, the, uh, the F-15s got a lot of kills air to air. The uh, A-10 got two kills, helicopters, yep. and the shiny pointy-nosed Viper F-16 got absolutely zippo. They wouldn't be liking that, would they? <laughs> no, no, they wouldn't. <laughs> Great stuff. But uh, yeah, so would you often work with the uh, Army and Navy? Yeah, all the time. Um, the, uh, obviously the primary role was working with the Army, not the Navy so much, but uh, you'd, you'd work with the Army because of troops in contact. Uh, the Army loves the A-10. The Army is- their first, uh, first choice. Oh, yeah, the Army absolutely loves the A-10 because uh, we could normally get there in a hurry. We can work very close to them, which, uh, which other fast-moving airplane can't do. You, uh, you are slow enough, you can be accurate enough that you can work in very close proximity to friendly troops and take care of the bad guys that are just across the valley or wherever. So uh, the Army absolutely loves us. Uh, my last job in the, uh, in the Air Force, I was commander of an organization called Air Warrior. It's now green flag, I think, but uh, it, is a, it is an exercise where they bring in uh, fighter units, A-10s, F-16s, others now, I believe, and uh, we, uh, we flew out of Nellis in, in Las Vegas, and you would work with the Army uh, at Fort Irwin. They had their own training program that pitted uh, an aggressor force of armor that was nice. trained in Soviet tactics. And this aggressor force, once again, they would bring in army units to oppose these aggressors. And we would operate out of Nellis to provide air support to this operation. So it was great training for us, it was great training for the army, and a very, very cost-effective way of getting some excellent training on the people still going on as it should. Steve, what was the cockpit like in the A-10? Was it all analog at that stage or was it digital in there? World War II. <laughs> it, was, it was all, it was, it was very, very, 
Well, it wasn't primitive, primitive because it was all new, but they didn't, uh, the Air Force built the A-10 for a number of reasons. One, to provide close air support, to punch up armor. And the third one that's always in the backs of their tiny minds in the Pentagon is to save money. So they didn't put in uh, an awful lot of magic we could have used. Uh, for an airplane designed to operate down in the weeds at 100 feet, racing around uh, the German plane or whatever, uh, it would have been nice to have an inertial navigation system. <laughs> we didn't. Uh, we had a map. Uh, your map, would uh, you'd cover it with, uh, with plastic. You'd scribble on it with grease pencil. You'd draw headings and distances and times. And then you'd unfold it in the cockpit and it would be all the way across, all the way up. And then you'd drop it on the floor. And that, uh, that, that's a challenge of its own. But we had none of that kind of thing, no avionics. We had three good radio systems, uh, I, will, I will say, uh, VHF, FM, and UHF. So we had good communications. But um, as far as some of the magic that they've got in the airplane, we had no lead computing site at all, nothing that took care of winds and that kind of thing like they have in the in the shiny pointy nose airplanes. They've got that now. They added that as it went along, along with the inertial system. Now, I believe, never been in one, but the C model of the A-10 is, uh, is a very capable airplane in terms of uh, uh, stuff to help the pilot do his job. Mm -hmm. Never was when I got in it. No touch screens. <laughs> no, but you, you learn to be a better pilot that way, Absolutely. I think. Absolutely, yeah, you must have the uh, thinking cap on. Absolutely, that yeah. So you probably have many, but maybe you can share like a memorable story from flying the Warthog. Oh yeah, again, lots of them. I think, I think in general, the most memorable things that we did were when I was uh, flying out of the forward operating location in Germany at uh, Nürnberg, which is a German, German F-104 base when we got there, and then they transitioned into tornadoes. But uh, our job was uh, to train pilots out of the Bentwaters wing in the area where they were going to fight. And if the Russians came across the inter-German border, that's where we were going to fight, in Germany. So we had four forward operating locations from the north in Alhorn down to Bavaria, a place called Leipheim, and two in between. I was at Norvenick, which is about halfway down near Cologne. And, um, I think, I think that training was probably the best we ever did because we, we rooted around uh, in the areas where we were going to fight. We got very, very close to the German border. We uh, got very familiar with the terrain in the German border. And we, uh, we, uh, we think we, had it happened, which of course it didn't, fortunately, uh, had it happened, we think we were in pretty good stead to, to stop the Russians. Ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> so how many hours did you get on the A-10? Almost exactly the same as the F-4. Uh -huh. I had 2,200 plus change, and again, uh, just about 12 years. So 4,400 hours total, half and half. <laughs> Couldn't do better than that. It's not bad, is it? And 12 years uh, in each. And sadly, one tour behind a desk, one and a half. You can't complain over 12 years no, for that. No, you can't. 28 years. 28, sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Steve, do you have any hobbies? Oh. Uh, not many that you would think of. I read a lot. I, uh, I, I, I go to the gym. I hit the gym still five days a week now that it's open again. Yep. Uh, but I've never been a golfer and I've never done any of those kind of things. I, uh, I, uh, I'm kind of a homebody now that I'm not traveling anymore. And uh, I try to look after my wife. Brilliant stuff. So Steve, this is going to be a difficult one. Favorite aircraft you've flown? Uh, it comes down to two, Mike, it's, uh, <laughs> as you might imagine. Uh, you, you couldn't come up with a more difficult question because uh, although they were apples and oranges, totally different in what they did and how they performed, uh, I'd have a very, very tough time ranking one ahead of the other. The Phantom was all power and speed and muscle. The A-10 was uh, maneuverability. Uh, it was the ability to, uh, to do a specific job better than any other airplane, and there was that magnificent gun. Uh, if I had to choose, if I really had to choose, I suppose the F-4 would get the nod, but not because of the airplane, because, uh, and Ernest Hemingway said it best, I put it in the book, 
He said, uh, uh, and I, I can't quote it, but he said, if you, if you, if if your first airplane is one that you love, it's a beautiful airplane. There, your heart will ever be, or something like that. And that's the case. The Phantom was first. The Phantom has a special place. So does the A10, but uh, maybe just a nose across the finish line for the F4. So two are outside right now, ready to go on the runway, you'd pick the F4. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> just. Just. Is there an aircraft you wish you could have flown in your career that you didn't manage to? Um, a couple of them, but not the new pointy, shiny ones. Um, the Spitfire and the P-51 Mustang. Wow, okay. uh, Those are the two airplanes that uh, I always wish I had had an opportunity to fly because they, for their day, were uh, the class. They were phantoms of the day, weren't they? Absolutely, they were. So Steve, you've also written a brilliant book from FO Phantom to the A10 Warthog. Can you tell us about this and how it came about? I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> yeah, I can. Uh, the book uh, came about because uh, uh, after I retired from the Air Force, I did a lot of other things in civilian life. But I, after I finally finished that up, or just about had finished it up, I got to thinking that uh, my career was a lot of fun. It was great. I had a lot of stories to tell. There are a lot of things that I did, a lot of places I went. Uh, I had a wife that was a big part of this, and I wanted to include all of those things. I thought about how to do that, and uh, it occurred to me that uh, uh, I'm no Robin Oles, I'm no Chuck Yeager. Uh, I never did anything particularly heroic. I never pinned a star on my shoulder. I did what uh, hundreds, perhaps thousands of fighter pilots have done before me and since. And so what I wanted to do is write a book, not about me, not about the United States Air Force, but about the people that I served with and about the culture and uh, what we were like as a, as a fraternity and what we were like as a brotherhood. And that's how it came about. It took me seven years because I'm lazy. Seven years. I, I had lots of stories, but uh, until my wife uh, every now and then appeared with a cattle prod and said, get on with it, Steve. I would tend to leave it for long periods of time, but finally got there. Finally uh, ended up with, uh, with, a, with a very helpful publisher, Pen and Sword, and uh, finally got it on the, uh, got it on the street in, uh, in September. So let's talk about the writing process. How did you go about it? About the? Writing process. How did ah. you? <laughs> <laughs> the, the way I did everything. Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, uh, uncoordinated. It was uh, uh, unsophisticated. It certainly was undisciplined. And basically, the writing process for me was uh, I, would, uh, I would get a flash of uh, inspiration. I'd uh, head off to the computer. I'd bang away for an hour or two, and then I'd go back to uh, whatever I was doing before until I got another flash of inspiration. So uh, I'm not, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, uh, a disciplined author or a guy who has a system. I just, uh, I just put it down as it went. And then I handed it off to my wife, who uh, my, uh, my best friend and my lover and uh, all the rest of it, also my fiercest critic. So that must have been a scary moment. And she edited it. <laughs> she, got out her, uh, she got out her yellow marker and her red pencil and, and uh, went to town on it, which meant when we finally got to the publisher and he sent it to his professional editor, she didn't have much to say about it. She thought it was great. So it went out uh, pretty much unscathed after that, thanks to, uh, thanks to my wife's editorial skills and cattle prod. <laughs> and uh, uh, that's, how it, that's how it came to being. Mm -hmm. And who designed the front cover, because it's great? Um, well, Pen and Sword had a guy, uh, uh, a lot of their covers look alike, or similar. I mean, they're colorful, they're, uh, they're, 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 they show motion, they do the rest of it. Uh, I would have been happier if they'd left the F4 and the A10 designations out of it. I think that complicates it a little bit. Oh, yeah. But uh, the distributors in the States wanted it in, and uh, once you sign with the publisher, they've got the hammer, exactly. so they put it in. Uh, but I like the cover. How could I not like the cover? That's me. Work, that's, yeah. that's me. When that's a I great was, fighter pilot pose as well. That's <laughs> me helmets. when I was thinner and uh, and fitter and uh, and handsomer. Yeah. So, uh, but I, I like the cover. The only problem with the cover 
and I'll get this now, uh, the book is doing very, very well in the States. It's doing okay in the, in the UK, and I understand why. You go into a bookstore, you see it online, you see this cover, and what do you see? You see a Yank fighter pilot, you see two Yank airplanes, uh, one of which, of course, the F-4, the FGR-2, was flown over here a lot, but primarily it's an American airplane, and you look at it and you say, ah, another book by an American. So what I'm hoping, since uh, you have a great following here in the UK, is that, uh, that people will pick up on the fact that this book isn't about me, or American, or the USAF. It's about a fraternity, it's about a brotherhood, it's about an attitude, it's about a culture. And I think, I may be wrong, but I don't think I am, I think most people, male, female, aviation oriented or not, will find something that they enjoy about this book. Yeah, it's a brilliant book, and one of my favorite quotes, you meant it, uh, mentioned it earlier, is like, the warthog was butt ugly. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> but he changes his mind, don't worry. <laughs> so yeah, Steve, where can we find the book online? Okay, you can find it uh, most anywhere you find books. You can find it on Amazon. You can find it, uh, if you're in the UK, you can find it through my, uh, my publisher, that's Pen and Sword. Um, you can find it uh, at most any bookseller. Probably the simplest way is to go to my website. And my website is uh, HTTPS uh, phantom to warthog.com. Um, and uh, if, you, uh, if, you, if you look there and look at the book section, uh, there are links to various, uh, various vendors on the bottom of that. Or just type my name into Google. Stephen K. Ladd or Phantom to Warthog and it'll come up and tell you where you can get it. Exactly, yeah. So can our viewers maybe get a signed copy at all? Uh, yeah. Um, as you can imagine, it's a little difficult because it's sold both in the U.S. and the U.K. But my publishers came up with a scheme which is working very, very well. It's called a signature plate. And uh, the free and they're uh, real, they're not copies. Uh, I have writer's cramp from signing the damn things. I've signed hundreds of them. But uh, all you have to do is, uh, uh, and I've, I've got that uh, uh, on, my, uh, on my website, but all you have to do is send a, an email to the publishers. We can put that somewhere on the description below. Yeah. Yeah. Put that on the, uh, to, to the publishers and ask for a signature plate and uh, they will dispatch one free of charge. It's self-adhesive. It's not, uh, it's not uh, tacky in any way. It's a good looking little piece of kit. You, you fasten it wherever you want to in the book. Self-adhesive, sticks in there, fits very nicely and it's a uh, presto, you got a signed book. There you go. Well, Steve, thank you very much for sharing a bit about your story. Pleasure, I enjoyed it. Thank you.